Hello, my friends. My name is Darren Gertis, and these are the three, actually four big stories today. Some of you have been asking me, how come three stories in three minutes is now taking longer? Well, that's because some of the others of you are asking me, uh, why can't you go deeper on these issues? Well, I, it's, I can do one or the other. I can't necessarily do both easily, but I'm going to try to cover the four big stories here very quickly and let's get to it. So we're going to look at Europe, we're going to look at what's happening in the United States in Congress, and then we're going to look at what's actually happening about mobilization in Russia, and this is big. Okay, first, in Europe, this was the headline in The Economist. Ukraine's European allies are either broke, small, or irresolute. I'm going to read like two or three sentences, or two or three paragraphs, and this is really profound. The perfect European, or so the sarcastic quip goes, should drive like a Frenchman, cook like the Dutch, be as organized as the Greeks, and humorous as the German. A variant of the joke might haunt those trying to devise the perfect ally for Ukraine as it fends off Russian aggression. Imagine a country the size of Latvia, with the budget problems of the hard-up Italians, the willingness to pitch in of the Kremlin-loving Hungarians, and the arms industry of neutral Ireland. Alas, that is close to the reality of Europe today. Support from Europe and America has, has helped to keep the Ukrainian state solvent and its soldiers in the battle. But now a dearth of artillery shells, supplies of which Europe has promised but is struggling to deliver, means holding the front line is press, a pressing aim for Ukraine, not counterattacking in a way that might force Russia to sue for peace. Worse, if Donald Trump wins the election in November, Europe could be left with the prospect of fending off Russia alone. Okay, so that's kind of the state of where we are in Europe. Now, it's not much better in the United States, as you know, with the Congress and all that, but Europe is trying in spite of having many conflicts. When you have about 30 allies trying to work together, it becomes fairly tricky. But nonetheless, here we are. EU leaders urged to put economies on war footing at Ukraine negotiations. Just a couple paragraphs here. EU leaders are to meet in Brussels to discuss ways to radically increase military and financial support for Ukraine amid calls for member states to put their economies on a war footing. Look, if the EU had the will and could decide, we're going to do this, they would crush Russia. Russia, I mean, their economy compared to the EU is nothing, but they have to have the willingness, the urgency in order to do it. Charles Mitchell, the president of the European Council, said in a pre-summit letter to leaders, now that we are facing the biggest security threat since the Second World War, it's high time we take radical and concrete steps to be defense ready and put the EU's economy on a war footing. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of what they need to do if they're going to be successful. Now, they have alternatives. Like money doesn't come out of thin air. You can tax more, which people don't like, or you can reduce services, which people don't like. So there is an alternative, but that alternative should have been done already. The alternatives, raising taxes or cutting public services to fund defense, are unpalatable to most, but one diplomat raised the possibility of mandating each country to contribute 2% of their national GDP to EU defense. This would generate as much as $80 billion, they claimed. Well, that's what NATO was supposed to be doing, and only a fraction, I don't remember exactly how many, maybe half of those countries, not even half, were actually doing that. So that's where we are in Europe. A little bit more about Europe. They're doing some things well. The European Commission says the first 4.9 billion released from the Ukraine aid fund, but this is for financial. This isn't for artillery shelves and things along those lines. European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen said the first 4.9 billion payment in financial aid has been made to Ukraine from a support fund set up to help Kyiv as it battles invading Russian forces. The fund created at the start of the month aims to help the country's public finances to keep the the government rolling. Like, that's the idea there. Okay, let's turn our attention to the United States. Oh, sorry. One more thing. EU leaders mull ways to get more arms to outgun Ukraine amid a new sense of urgency. Just one little bit in here. The 27-nation EU is holding around 200 billion euros, 228 billion dollars, in Russian central bank assets, most of it frozen in Belgium, in retaliation for Moscow's war in Ukraine. The bloc estimates that the money it could generate from profits up to 3 billion euros, 3.3 billion dollars a year, if they just use the uh, interest off of the money that is held in these banks. So that's what they're trying to do right now, is to work through that. And that's, that's a little 
that's a lot less bad than just seizing that money and using it for Ukraine. If they seize that money and just use it for Ukraine, that is going to destroy the banking system. That's a very, very bad thing. It will chase most of the rest of the world that's leery about it away from using the banking system as it exists. But this is a way of splitting the difference, and they're working at it. Okay, so this picture says it all between these particular leaders here. Okay, uh, let's turn our attention now, instead of to the United States, let's look at, well, let's look at the United States first. Um, here is, uh, Democrats are open to a loan strategy for Ukraine aid. So this is a really interesting article as well. Now, I don't want a loan strategy, but I want support, and I'll take support however I can get it. I don't like the Senate bill compared to what else other might be able to be done, but I'll take the Senate bill if we could get that through. But if I can't get that through, I want the next best thing. Democrats in both chambers suggest that they're willing to support Ukraine aid in the form of a loan, an idea that's gaining steam with Kyiv's GOP champions as they scramble to end Congress's deadlock and help Ukraine battle Russian forces. The loan design is not the Democrats' preference. They're urging the adoption of an emergency foreign aid package that the Senate passed last month. That would be better, okay? Which includes $60 billion in aid for Ukraine, while hammering Speaker Mike Johnson for his refusal to put it on the House floor. But if the loan strategy, which Johnson floated to Republican senators last week, can break the impasse, a number of Democrats say they're all for it. Representative Bernie Thompson of Mississippi, the senior Democrat on the Homeland Security Committee, says, quote, you've got to get them some help. So if it comes in a loan, it's help. If it comes in an aid package with no requirements, it's still help. Few believe that Ukraine would ever pay back the loans given the trillions of dollars in reconstruction costs Kiev is sure to face whenever Russia, uh, Russian conflict ends, but the loan design might provide some political cover to leery Republicans who could pitch the idea to their constituents as a strategy for easing the financial burden on U.S. taxpayers. Okay, and, that, and that's fair. Um, it's not ideal. We don't want to do that. Pref we, I mean, if we had a preference... It, the preference would be the Senate bill, but if they're not going to go for that, fine. Get some help to them before it's too late. Okay, a little bit more. Um, let's turn our attention to Russia. Russia says Ukraine's idea of $30 oil price cap is beyond all bounds. So Lavrov doesn't like it, which means it's probably a good thing. So the idea is that after Russia sent troops to Ukraine in 2022, the West sought to sink the Russian economy by imposing a number of sanctions. It slapped $60 a barrel price cap on Russian oil, which is currently traded at about $68 per barrel. So it pushed it down and made them be able to um, uh, receive less revenue than they otherwise would. And now uh, Ukrainian President Zelensky is urging between $30 and $40 a barrel. Now, if they do that, that will limit oil on the market, and that's going to cause the price of oil to rise for everyone else. And they're arguing that the United States might not go for it. But actually, $30 a barrel on Russian oil would be a great move to strangulate the income that Russia has. Even better, what the Ukrainians have been doing with uh, targeting oil refineries with their drones, that, that's been a better way of going about doing this. But either way, I'll take the deal. The other day, I read that Ukraine was trying to convince the United States to lower the cap price on Russian oil to $30 a barrel, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said in an interview published in the Foreign Ministry website. This goes beyond all bounds. It is significant that the United States is unlikely to go along with Ukraine, Lavrov said. He argued that such a lowering of the cap would have serious impact on both the global oil market and the U.S. economy. Yes, it could have an impact, but mm, I don't know. They might just go for that. At any rate, let's look at what else is going on in Russia. I talked about this this morning where Defense Minister Shoigu announced the creation of new ground armies with 16 new brigades, 500,000 new Russian soldiers. Here's what Gabrielis Landsbergis, he's the foreign minister from Lithuania, had to say about that. Let's hear what he has to say. So you know, foreign minister, that some of the allies in NATO say, oh, the Baltics are screaming about, you know, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, and we don't see necessarily war imminent. Yeah, it's, it's a very difficult debate, honestly. And, uh, you know, we, we've been in that debate for, you know, as long as I can remember, specifically since 2014. Where after the you know the Minsk one and Minsk two agreements have been signed and a ceasefire was achieved, we've been telling to everybody that was 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 willing to to listen that Russia is not going to stop. 
We have mm -hmm. not seen the last of them. Right. And, you know, the, the story was the same. You know, we were told that, look, you know, you have to come down. You have your history behind you. You know, uh, we can argue with Russians and, you know, we have this agreement in place. When the war broke out again in 2022, you know, there were people coming out and saying, look, Baltics were right. And now you would hear Baltics saying exactly the same thing. Putin yep. is not about to stop. Today, we're hearing a message from, you know, from, from Putin's officials who are saying that they are going to recreate their army, basically, possibly mobilizing additionally up to one, up, up to 500,000 troops, additionally to what they currently have. They already have one third more than they had before the, the start of the war in, in 2022. Yep. Now they're planning additionally to, to, to mobilize. What would they need it for? That's a good question. If they are mobilizing another 500,000, is it something beyond Ukraine? And if so, that's a scary proposition. Okay, last little bit here. I want you to look at uh, this video, what's happening now and what will happen next. I did an interview with Greg Terry. We were just talking a few hours ago about like, like he couldn't live stream tonight. So we were doing this quick recording uh, and talking about not just what's going on on the front lines, but what's about to happen next as the Russians mobilize, as we get to a point where drone warfare really amps up, as other factors fall into place and he has a wealth of insight so please be sure to watch that thank you for the likes the shares the subscribes and the coffees and thank you for being the kind of person that cares about ukraine